Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for A Legacy of Extraction, Abandoned Mines on the Navajo Nation. Tonight, we'll be hearing from investigative journalist Arlissa Vicente about uranium mines and the impact they continue to have on communities on the Navajo Nation. Do you have a microphone? Um, I do, but this is for our live stream audience, actually. One second. The Climate Conversation series is about exploring the climate crisis and environmental issues affecting people everywhere, but especially in our state. We want to know what are the challenges facing Arizonans and what can we do about it. The Climate Conversation series is hosted by Arizona Humanities, the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Arizona Humanities supports public programs that explore the human experience with cultural, educational, and nonprofit organizations across Arizona. And this program tonight was made possible by funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And before I introduce our speaker tonight, I just want to go over some housekeeping. Um, so we'll have our presentation and then we'll have Q&A with the audience after the presentation. For all of you viewing from home tonight, you can ask your questions in the chat, which should be to the left of the screen. You will need a Google account to ask questions. Um, but if you don't have a Google account, you can use a Google form link, which is in the bottom um, in the description. And I'll also place a link in the chat momentarily. But if you have any questions during our list's talk, please drop them in the chat or in that uh, Google form. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight, Arlissa Vicente is a multi-award winning Diné journalist from Fort Defiance, Arizona, with over 10 years experience reporting on Navajo Nation. In 2020, she placed first for Arizona Press Club's community investigative reporting for her series on the illegal hemp and marijuana farms in Shiprock, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. She was also awarded Arizona Press Club's 2020 Nina Mason Pulliam Environmental Journalism Award for community reporting. She currently is the Indigenous Affairs Reporter for the Arizona Republic and has reported for the Daily Gallup Independent and Weekly Navajo Times. She was a Rory W. Howard Fellow at Arizona State University's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism, where she recently obtained her Master's in Investigative Journalism. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome Arlissa Vicente. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, everybody, for being here this evening. Um, that's just a formality in case somebody who is watching streaming um, is Navajo and they want to know if we're related clan wise. So um, that's my introduction. Um, good evening. I am Arlisa Vicente, and I am the Indigenous Affairs Reporter for the Arizona Republic. And tonight, I'm going to be talking about my reporting on uranium mining on the Navajo Nation. I'm from Fort Defiance, Arizona, which is probably about 10 miles from Winder Rock, which is the capital of the Navajo Nation. So I'm going to give you a little update. Well, tonight's presentation is going to be just more of an overview of my entire reporting, um, especially the current stuff that I'm working on. Uh, I'm going to be. I'm going to give you a little update. I'm sorry. I'm a little nervous. Going to give you a little update of what's happening now on a situation I've been covering for almost two years, and you know, just kind of introducing you to sources that I've spoken to over the years, and um, and just so you know, you can grasp uh, at what the Navajo Nation is dealing with when it comes to uranium mining. Uh, uranium mining happened between the 1940s to 1980. Um, from 1944 to 1986, nearly 30 million tons of uranium was extracted from the Navajo Nation. And people believe it's a thing of the past, but really it's not. We still deal with it completely in a lot of different ways, some of us more so than others on the nation. And I've been covering uranium on, on and off for several years. It wasn't something that I wanted to report on because um, a lot of people come into the communities and that's what they report on. You can read about uranium on Navajo from different articles, from reporters from all over the world. You can see documentaries, you can read books about it. So that was, so uranium was just not something that I thought I had to report on. But when new stuff, new information was coming up, I had, I felt it within me to update my community and my people of what exactly was happening. So um, this is my first slide. Um, in Navajo, that says so doda, meaning no uranium. So over the summer in July, I took this photo as I entered 
the Redwater Pond Road Community Associations event. Um, they were holding this past summer this, um, this event, the 43rd Uranium Telling Spill Legacy Commemoration. If you all aren't aware of this piece of history, let me just kind of tell you a little bit about it. On July 16, 1979, an earthen dam owned by the United Nuclear Corporation broke and released 1,100 tons of radioactive uranium tailings and 93 million gallons of toxic wastewater into the Puerco River, contaminating the river for at least 80 miles and impacting about 11 Navajo Nation communities. And I'll get more um, into the Red Water Group, but this is the community and it, it's Red Water Pond Road community. And so at this year's commemoration here, I don't know if it was the first time they were able to um, come together for the first time face to face since COVID. If you know the Navajo Nation, the first two years of COVID was, was very strict with mandates. So face-to-face -face meetings was um, pretty much non-existent. That was something that could not happen. So their commemoration that they have annually was um, canceled. So I think this was the first one they, they were able to, um, s to go to again in person. And during this event, um, let's see, but this commemoration was to discuss an issue that had actually brought up, that was actually brought up during the pandemic. And because we couldn't see each other face to face in meetings or, you know, because in Navajo, we always have meetings, they're called chapter meetings. So they come along, community members come together and they discuss the issues at hand that's happening on the nation, what's happening with the government and what's happening within their chapter. So trying to discuss this specific issue that I'm gonna talk about um, coming up soon, it was hard for them to really understand how this will impact them, how they're gonna be able to fight this issue. And this issue is this, in 2018, a request to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was made by General Electric, which is UNC, which UNC um, is a subsidiary of, and UNC is the United Nuclear Corporation. And what this amendment would propose is to amend a license that would allow for disposal of mine impacted soil and debris from the adjacent Church Rock mine site onto the existing NRC license mill tailings disposal area that was just in that area, which basically meant that 1 million cubic yards of mine waste would be disposed of within the footprint of the Church Rock mill site tailings disposal area. So the Church Rock mine is on the Navajo Nation. That's situated there. But just a down, down the road, like maybe less than a mile, is the mill site. And that is off the Navajo Nation, and that's where they want to dispose that waste. So in 2018, this amendment, or this request to amend this license in order to transport that waste was requested by um, United Nuclear Corporation. And like I said, it was during the pandemic. Nobody could really, the government, the nomination government was, was really at a standstill for quite a while. And the community could not really meet up and try to figure out how they can stop this this transfer of the waste and what they wanted more than anything they wanted to take this waste off site off the Navajo Nation nowhere near the, na the nation at all because they had already um, had to deal with a lot of uh, issues when it came to the to the Church Rock um, mine spill in 1979 so um, the community at the time had been working alongside former President Jonathan Nez and the Navajo Nation EPA Superfund to not have this happen, like I just said. There were radio forums, public comment period meetings, and just last April, the NRC and I believe the US EPA did meet with the Redwater Pond community to discuss this plan that they did not want to happen. Um, but just last week, I was notified that the NRC did in fact approved a license amendment that will allow for the waste to be taken just a mile down the street. During one of the uh, radio public forums in 2021 that was discussing this license amendment, um, it was acknowledged by the NRC that the price would be cheaper just to go down the street and dump the waste compared to the price it would be for the offsite um, dump. <laughs> 
To dump the waste down the road would cost $44 million. And to dump it off in the nearest off-reservation facility would be $293 million. And that was in 2021, so I'm pretty sure it's probably more than that now. Um, so obviously the community was really hoping and fighting for this waste that comes from a time that has severely impacted their lives and livelihood and home to just be um, taken out completely. Okay, so just a little history of the uranium on Navajo. So in, when I was working for the Navajo Times and for Gallup Independent, my main beat was reporting on the Navajo Nation government. And our Navajo Nation government is pretty powerful. It's very influential, one of the most influential tribal governments out there. So, and this is, so we're gonna talk about a little bit how they were established. In the Navajo Nation Council was first established 100 years ago in 1923, but before that, first in 1922, the U.S. Secretary of the Interior created the Navajo Business Council so they could certify mineral leases on Navajo because oil was discovered in a little area close to Shiprock. And what they needed to do was they needed to get this oil, and so they had to get um, Navajo Nation to to basically certify it. And the only way they could do that is if they had uh, leadership to do it. But they didn't have the council at that point. So that's when they, they developed the Navajo Business Council at first in 1922. And then a year later is when our Navajo Nation Council was established. And so our government was formed to deal with oil extraction. A hundred years later, the Navajo Nation Council continues to make decisions and negotiations to extract resources from tribal lands, which will have long lasting ramification to land, water, people, as is evident with the four decades of uranium mining, and most recently coal. And right now, the Navajo Nation is kind of looking into helium extraction, which I may touch more on a little bit later. Um, from the 1940s and 1980s is when uranium was extracted from Navajo Nation. And it's been said that there's over 500 abandoned uranium mines. That number may not be correct. Um, I've spoken to different people who are like in direct contact with these uh, abandoned uranium mines and or who actually work out into the field where these AUMs are situated. And people say there are way more than that. Um, there could be at least over a thousand AUMs across the Navajo Nation. Um, because AUMs are still discovered even today. And, but that's the, but over 500 abandoned uranium mines is the, the Navajo EPA's number that they have, so we'll just go with that for now. Um, I really don't like to talk about the history of uranium mining as if, oh, it's something of the past. Um, this is something that did happen but it still has very real deadly consequences as we speak. When I read other articles about the uranium on Navajo, which, you know, there's a lot of articles out there, to me, it's in a passive voice. The ramifications are not, or the ramifications are now this minute. It continues on. If all the AUMs were cleaned up, people were given substantial health benefits, or reclamation of land and water had happened, then I say it was a thing of the past, but it, no, it's, we're not even near any of that. Um, so when I think about the recent events happening in Ohio and everything, um, was it Florida, Texas, of all these train crashes with toxins leaking out, I only think about church rock mine spill. Um, there has been oil spills on the Navajo Nation. Um, it's, this is just not, this is one of many different spills that have happened. But I always come back to the Church Rock Mine spill because of just the magnitude of how much was um, put into the land, put into the water, and what it had done over the years. And I'm worried about those train crashes carrying toxins that are polluting the air, land, water, and animal, because it's all too familiar for us on the Navajo Nation. And judging how the federal government dealt with our plight, I can only hope they do better when dealing with those other situation. The coverage was minimal at the Church Rock Mine. Um, it's considered the largest U.S. radioactive spill in U.S. history 
And still to this day, I meet people who don't even know that that happened. There's a really great trail, um, it's called Pyramid Rock, close to Church Rock. And you know, people, tourists come through that area and I, I, sometimes I get to talking with them and I tell them about the history of the area. I tell them um, where the mines were, how close we are to it. And then I tell them about the Church Rock Mine Spill of 1979. And they are usually surprised that it even happened because there was minimal coverage and no one ever talks about it. Um, I read that a year after the spill had happened, the Navajo Nation filed a lawsuit for $12 million against the Nucle um, United Nuclear Corporation on behalf of 125 Arizona and New Mexico Navajo families for damages. Um, they say resulted from the spilling of the radioactive water in the Prairco River. And then in 1980, the Arizona Department of Health Services warned families living along the Prairco River in Navajo and Apache County to avoid the water and keep their livestock out of the river. The levels of radioactivity in the river exceeded Arizona's maximum limit at that time. The department said um, the department began te testing the water from the Prairco River, and that's where they figured out that the that the um, maximum limit had hit its had hit its point. And then the New Mexico Environmental Improvement Division said the danger is not at a level to cause any reason for concern. So we had two different states. We had Arizona being concerned, and then we had New Mexico that wasn't concerned at all. Even at the time, the New Mexico governor, Bruce King, refused the Navajo Nation's request that the site be declared a federal disaster area, and this um, caused limited aid to the affected residents. So what has already transpired in East Pal um, Palestine, Palestine, Ohio, is comparable to what has happened on the Navajo Nation decades ago. And to this day, the Navajo Nation and its people are still not receiving the assistance and aid that it absolutely wholeheartedly needed and deserves. Instead, it's as if we're forgotten and ignored. And that's really, um, that's really what is happening. Uh, people really do ignore or forget what the area has gone through and what the people are currently still going through. And I'll get back into that soon. Um, I fear more than anything that we as a people are gonna get tired of waiting for anything to be done and we will be fine with the devastation of our land, water, and our people's health at the hands of uranium mining because it really is becoming a norm um, to deal with uranium mines and all that, ha that comes with it. So, slide three. This is the red water pond community. So right here, I, I don't, I think that's Church Rock Mine, I know, but um, this here, uh, not too far from it, is a road that goes straight to the homes. And the homes are not even like a mile down the street. So this is how close they are to an abandoned uranium mine. And I took this photo on the same day I took the first photo during that commemoration. And as homes sit, few feet from, the, from this mine, Red, Red Water Pond community is about 20 miles northeast from Gallup, New Mexico. This community has an association that was made by the residents, which is called Red Water Pond Community Association. And the AUMs that sit there are the Northeast Church Rock Mine, the Tronics Mine, and the United Nuclear Corporation mill site. So they're just surrounded by all of this. And this association um, is a grassroots organization of Diné families who have experienced and lived with the impacts of uranium mining and milling in the Church Rock mining area since the 1960s. Their mission um, is to restore the land and water contaminated by uranium mining, improve the health of the community members, and protect and preserve the natural and cultural environment in which they live. So I'm sure people I'm sure that they've heard many times over is people saying, well, why don't they move? So moving out of the community is not the solution and not an option for the 53 families who choose to stay in their homes. The cultural ties to the land is strong, even if the EPA, eh, here we go, the EPA has told, has said this before, and this is what kind of really gets me upset, is that the mines came, and once the mines came, the people came along with it, and that is, that's not true. Um, people there can trace back their lineage over a hundred years ago. 
and I can really understand the cultural ties. Like I can be in the city here for no more than two weeks when I ha and then I just have to go home. I have to go back to the Navajo Nation. It's just something that I, I really feel at the pit of my tummy that I really just miss all the time. So I can understand why nobody wants to leave their home um, because their medicines there, their, their ceremonial sites, their cultural ties, everything is right there. And it's, it's something that tugs at you and you just, you, you really can't leave it. And that's why I always have to, have to leave Phoenix after a couple of weeks. So now these are, the, I'm gonna be talking about the people that I've spoken to over the years. And this is one of them, Teresita Kiana, um, or Terry as she goes by. She's a mom and she's a wife and she does a lot of different really cool stuff. And she is from Redwater Pond. And she lives in uh, Gallup because they told her that they were gonna clean the area of where, of where she was living at. And she didn't want her children to be around that. So um, this is her and I'll tell you what she's doing soon. So her grandmother, Catherine Duncan, I spoke to her a couple of days ago for a story that I was working on. And Catherine Duncan, her grandmother, she was not a worker um, um, that worked in the mines. She was an office janitor who cleaned the office buildings in one of the um, mines that she had worked in. I think it was Kerr McGee. Um, I really don't know. I forgot. Um, and she said um, when her grandmother was working in the offices, even though she wasn't exposed through the mine or just you know dealing, not even touching uranium or anything like that, she was still exposed because her grandmother worked in the offices and cleaned her bo boss's office, and her boss had uranium ore on his table. And I remember during the interview, Duncan told, or um, Terry told me that she watched her grandmother suffocate to death because she had pulmonary fibrosis that she had developed due to um, working as an office janitor. So I really wanted to put her audio up of what she says because her voice, you can really hear, you can really hear her frustration. Um, but I couldn't because I wasn't able to work it on here. So I'm just gonna read out a, a quick um, quote from her. And this is what she said. Um, it's something that the community is not going to get over. This is very traumatic. This was a whole event that not only changed the way we think about the uranium industry, but it changed our DNA by contaminating and radiating itself onto our bodies and made different kinds of changes in our bodies. And you know, that makes it to the point where we don't have that hojon in ourselves anymore. We don't have that balance. And that's what we are trying to achieve as a community, to bring that hojon back to our community and bring it back to our land and bring it back to our bodies and minds. Even to practice our culture at home is something we can't even do because of the contamination that has gone into the ground and vegetation, it has gone into the air and water. We took all that contamination into our bodies just by being in that location. And Hojon in Navajo means balance, beauty. So um, she grew up in Redwater Pond and you know, she, she and I are probably the same age and she used to herd sheep with her grandma. She never put much thought about her community's location um, near an area contaminated by uranium. That fence that I had that picture up, um, that wasn't there. So she would just explore all over. She would go in and out of these and play on these rocks and the sand, all of this crazy stuff. And you know, she would herd her grandma's sheep unknowingly letting them graze in the most contaminated parts of the community because there were no fences or signs to warn her of the hazards. She would take a drink of water that she'd find in nearby puddles, which was nothing out of the ordinary, but later realized of how dangerous these seemingly innocent acts were. And as an adult, she now works to educate children about their uranium contaminated community. And that's what she uses. She uses this comic book that you can find on the, on the EPA website. And those are other little um, like, comic books that she used and, 
and puzzles to, to tell the children of that community where she grew up what to watch out for, for open pit, for yellow cake. And these, I saw the kids that were there and they're like no more than 10 years old. And that is really depressing when I really think about it. So when I met her during the commemoration that summer, I was trying to take photos of the event and the kids were present. And Terry was very protective um, that once she saw me get my phone situated to take a photo, she told me to stop and she said, we don't allow photos taken of the kids and I apologize. So she's really, really protective. And just that moment, you could tell that she, um, that her, her community and the children and trying to get the awareness out there is very important to her. Um, there are other media at that event as well because that, this, this Red Pond community and their events are very, they're, they're famous. You have documentary makers who come to this event just to, just to record what's happening. You have a lot of media. They have a lot of media attention just on that one day out of the whole um, annual, their annual event. Um, later on, I was able to interview her and she had a tent set up, which she's in right now, um, for the kids. And I saw on the table that comic book, Gamma Go in the Dangers of Uranium. This comic you can find on EPA website, as I just said, it first printed in 1999 and it warns kids not to go into shafts, collect rocks from debris piles or cool off in open pit mines that they may think is a good swimming pool. Um, yeah, she was one of the, uh, there's a few other people that I've spoken to who have done that. They see, they see like a little puddle and they want to they play in it. And that's what um, a lot of us kids do when we're over there. Uh, one thing about Terry here. So one thing about Terry here is I asked her as I was talking to her a couple days ago for my story, if anyone from her community would talk to me and tell me what they think about the license amendment being, um, being allowed. And basically what she said was, she can't guarantee that anyone will talk to me, but she'll give them my contact information. And she said this, and she said, um, what did she say? Um, I asked if the lawyer could also speak to me for their group, and she said the lawyer doesn't like to talk to media. And it reminded me why I do what I do, um, and why I cover what I cover, and why I stay on the Navajo Nation to, do, to cover my people and to cover their issues, and how I continue to stay put on the Navajo Nation. She said that she couldn't guarantee it because this is a traumatic episode in her relatives and community members' lives especially the older people, the elders, because they actually lived through it. And for them to keep telling their story, it hurts. And uh, not only that, journalists come into the Navajo Nation and basically are doing their own extraction of getting information from these community members and using it for their own good and for their own use. And they never see them again. That's why that's why me personally I don't really condone parachute journalism because it really does hurt the community and I've seen it I've seen parachute journalism um, the, the what it can do to to people when people give you that information and try to be I don't know just opening up their communities to you and for journalists just to come in just for that one sad story and taking it with them and you never see them again. You don't know when it's going to be published. You, you don't even know, you don't even remember who the reporter is. Um, that's just, that's something that really, um, something I really gets on my, my nerves. Um, uh, people just come, yeah. That's why I try to do updates every so often. So I did this story in August. I'm doing another story that just came, that's going to come out tomorrow. Um, so my updates, so they know, so the people that I, I talk to, the sources, they know that they're not forgotten when I try to talk to them. So they know that their voices is still being heard and it's still important for people to read what is happening within their community. I like to introduce my sources and my articles and keep them in there because in there when another um, article comes out because people start to f um, form a familiarity with those sources who allow me 
uh, to have their stories and to write about it. And I know that people uh, who continue to read my stuff want to know what happened to these sources that I've introduced them to. So in the best way possible and the best way I can do it, um, when I'm updating, I try to use the same sources and give updates on the situation and the issue. That is, that is very important to me because I started on this story, like the first one came out in 2019. So every time I would always look for a different update in 2020 and then to now. Because I know, it's, I know that community members want to know what is happening with this license. And if this were to happen on the Navajo Nation to where the waste site is going to be just down the street, who knows if they're going to bring other waste from the state or from any other parts in over the world and throw the waste out in this area that, that they're going to be doing here soon. And for her to say that you know other journalists come in, extract information from them, and then leave, she even said that PhDs and doctorate candidates and masters, um, students who get their masters, come to their uh, community and they get information as well and they leave and her, her elders and the people that talk to them, they're just, that just really gets them, I guess, insult, they're insulted and yeah. So, um, so I understand her frustration. Um, slide five. So this is the contaminated water. This is researcher Dr. Tommy Rock of Monument Valley. Um, he discovered some uranium contamination in the drinking water in small communities of Sanders in eastern Arizona. And like, like Terry, Tommy has been impacted by uranium mining. Um, so while covering uranium issues on Navajo, I noticed that it's the victims. Those who have been impacted directly, whether it be them personally, their family, neighbors, community, it's these people who are trying to gain awareness and speak out and demand justice. This is Dr. Tommy Rock from Monument Valley, and he too has been personally impacted by uranium like Terry. His grandfather worked in a uranium mine and had cancer, and like Terry, like Terry, Tommy used to play in places he shouldn't have been playing because of the uranium exposure and because lack of education. He didn't know that those places were, were places that he shouldn't be. And this travesty in his family was what directed him to learn about uranium. When I said there are over 500 uranium mines, uh, Dr. Rock here has noted that there are over 1,000. One of the many consequences of the spill was discovered only in 2015. Um, the Church Rock Mine Spill. After Tommy was testing unregulated wells along the Puerco River, it measured, he measured uranium levels at 43 parts per billion in the waters uh, in Sanders. That's well above the EPA level of 30 parts per billion. Now Sanders is alongside uh, I-40. It's the checkerboard. It's half of its Navajo Nation and the other isn't. So when this was found out, the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority had to buy out the Arizona Windsong Water Company, a public water system that served the park estates in Sanders. And while serving the former wells, serving the former Arizona Windsong Water System um, were taken off so NTUA could serve the community. A treatment plant to remove uranium went online in 2017 at the Sanders Unified Elementary School to treat the water there. Now I remember those, those meetings back in 2015 where the community would all come together in the Sanders um, chapter house and just talk to their leaders, their Navajo leaders, and discuss like what was happening, how, how did this continue on for so long? I mean, the, the, the spill was in 1979, this is 2015, and these wells are still contaminated and they had no idea. And that is why I think, um, that's why not only I, but you know, Tommy and Terry think that we are all being ignored and forgotten when it comes to these travesties. Okay. This was an article I did in 2018. Um, this is a uranium mine worker that I spoke with, Leslie Begay, and Leslie, as a marine veteran, 
and he, um, he came home and he began working in uranium mines at Kermagee um, near Gallup. And let's see. Um, so I talked to a few uranium miners, Leslie being one of them. And this is only one of, one of the former uranium miners I've spoken to. And he was diagnosed with lung cancer. He worked for Kermagee Mine for eight years. In this picture I took, he is showing me his prescription bag from the medical center in Fort Defiance indicating that this medication is out of stock. Mm -hmm. His mother had passed on from liver cancer. He believes it was because she was exposed to what he, his brother, and dad brought back from the mine because they were all uranium mine workers. Leslie and other advocates were heading to D.C. back in 2018 in order to lobby for the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act to expand on benefits for downwinders, post-1971 mine workers, and certain types of cancers. Leslie was a Vietnam veteran who served in the Marines, and right after he returned, he began working in a uranium mine. And, um, you know, when I speak to these miners, I, they're the same age as my dad, and to see them, you know, my dad's really healthy, and to see them like this, it, it really, it's really sad. It really is. I remember talking with him. I don't know how he's doing. Um, I haven't seen him since 2018. But he, his real fight was to get medical service, adequate medical service for his cancer. For most of the part, he was getting a lot of his services from the Veterans Hospital and then at the Tseo Tso Medical Center in Fort Defiance. But again, Tseo Tso Medical Center didn't have his prescriptions. And so another uranium mine worker that I spoke to, um, his name was Tommy Reed. I met him a few years ago, and I don't have a photo of him, but I have the articles that I wrote using his story. And he said he worked 16-hour days, never leaving until he was done for the day, and he worked with Leslie. He said there was no safety training, no portables, no place to wash, nothing in the mine, and when they tried to fight for safer working conditions, they were met with threats of being fired. His condition was a, his health conditions was a list of different ailments such as enlarged heart, constant coughing, and his lungs weren't holding up too well. And then another person I spoke to, um, in the late 1970s, Leroy Basenti, went to uranium mining school and became a utility miner for Kermagee in Church Rock. And this again was in 2018 or 2019, and he was at that point recently diagnosed with stomach cancer. Um, so he went to work for the mines the way let everybody else did, because it was good money. And so since Basenti did not work in the mines until after seven, 1971, he wasn't, able, he wasn't um, able to get RICA. So that's why he was trying to, to um, advocate that they expand that. Um, Let's see. So Leroy Vicente also had a brother, Edison Vicente, who died from cancer because he too was also a uranium, uranium mine worker. He called it a drilling, um, the ones that were drilling, digging, and taking out the ore. That's what he did. Um, so in July, 19, uh, July 31, 31st, 2018, about 400 former uranium miners and family members of deceased miners came to the Phil Thomas Performing Arts Center to testify on why they need this um, RECA to be expanded when it comes to the benefits. A two-year extension of RECA was signed by uh, President Biden in June. The short-term extension only provides more time to work with congressional members on a long-term solution that would extend the act until 2040, expand downwinder eligibility based on geographic residency, and expand the range of years that can be used for calculating exposure for certain individuals working in uranium mine mills or transporting uranium ore. The thing I remember about Leroy Basenti, I, I don't know how these men are doing right now, but when I met him, it was at a time when I was thinking, like, I wonder where Basenti comes from. Where does Basenti, where does my last name come from? I want to know the origins because it's just so interesting. There's a place where my, my dad's from Crown Point, New Mexico, and that area, along with other little communities, 
everyone's a Basenti. There's even a Basenti community called Basenti Chapter. And so I always wondered, how do we not know where this name came from? And so when I met Leroy Basenti, um, he told me a story about how Basenti came to be. He, I remember him coming up to me and he asked me what I was doing there and I told him I was working for the Navajo Times and I was reporting on the, on, on the testimonies. And he said, um, Basenti, who's your dad? And everybody knows who my dad is. And I told him, my dad's Archie Basenti. And he's like, oh, I know him. And he's like, do you know where Basenti comes from? And I said, no. And so he told me this long-winded story. And I was just so grateful that he told me that story because I had not only a week prior was thinking, where does that last name come from? I need to find out. And so I asked him, like, why are you here? What's, what's going on? Are you here with your family? And he's like, no, um, I have stomach cancer. I was just diagnosed. And for him to come up to me, to get to know me, to tell me a story before even bringing the, the, the spotlight back onto him, what is wrong with him, what his ailments are, it, it just proves that, uh, I don't know, it's just, it was just so, I was just so thankful for that. And it, it makes you really wonder how people who have risked their lives, like Tommy, Leroy, Leslie, how they've done so much for this country, whether it be for the Marines in Vietnam or whether it be uranium miners, how they can be forgotten, how their health can just not even be a concern. And so um, I really don't know how these men are. All I can do is pray that they're well. And slide seven. Cove Dave School. Um, Cove is a pretty interesting place. It's a beautiful, beautiful area. Mountains, cliffs, trees, you name it, it's got it. And Cove Day School was built in 1959, which is in northeastern Arizona, at a time when uranium mining was in full swing on the Navajo Nation. So by that time, like 10 years before, is when they started really started up on uranium mining. It's reported that Cove has about 32 abandoned uranium mines in the area, raising issues about contamination. Recently, the Bureau of Indian Education and the community held a meeting to seek community input on the replacement of the school. The funny thing is, it was, it's a public meeting. It's a two-day meeting. I, I signed up. I listened in on the Zoom and the, second, the first day. And the second day, um, they saw my name, and they asked everyone to introduce themselves. And that's when they, I said, reporter, or Lisa Vicente, and they said, nope, no reporters. And so I, I just left it at that. I don't know why they did that. I still think about it. So the three things that they wanted to do, um, the three inputs that they had on what they should do about the school is should the current location of Code Day School be feasible to proceed with a new school project? Should the new school be built at a different location? And if so, what alternative sites are recommended? Should Cove Day School be considered with nearby, or consolidate with Red Rock Day School, which is like 14 miles down the road? Cove Day School offers kindergarten to sixth grade classes, while Red Rock Day School, which is what they're considering consolidating with, offers kindergarten to eighth grade classes. Currently, there are 50 students enrolled in Cove compared to 114 students at Red Rock. So last September, there were four unresolved radiation hotspots located on the school's exterior grounds, as well as four areas of elevated radon, a, car a carcinogenic um, radioactive gas located inside the school, all linked to uranium mining. It's because of this that Cove Day School had to be shut down last year Though it has since reopened, the issue is also the reason why BIE is again discussing different options with the community. When addressing the uh, Cove Day School closure last year, the former um, executive director for the Navajo Nation Environmental Protection Agency, Belinda Shirley, said there are two parties that are responsible for the abandoned uranium mines in that area, Tronics and Cypress Amex. 
while 11 mine sites don't have responsible, area, um, responsible parties. And that's one of the big issues is like a lot of the, the AUMs don't have responsible parties. They don't know who, who dug up that stuff. And so, um, so she said like a lot of the mining happened up in the mountain and the only way that the, the, the material came through could be through uh, flooding or a haul. And this is when I say that I'm afraid that as a people we're going to stop fighting and we're going to stop trying to get some sort of um, assistance by the federal government or to have it cleaned up completely is because of this, this comment um, from one of the grandparents uh, during this meeting. And she said, we should have a new school now, said Nancy Benali, a community member and grandmother. I'm looking forward to it. I want to see it. We're getting old. This uranium is going to go on and on. I lived with it. We are not going to get away from uranium. And that really strikes, strikes a chord with me only because I feel like it's a waiting game for us that they want us to forget it and just be fine with it. And that is something that needs to be addressed. So now we have future fears. Um, I think that's the last thing, but right now we have future fears. And I discussed helium, I mentioned helium earlier. <laughs> so on his last day in office, Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez vetoed a resolution that would have uh, approved operating lease agreements between the Navajo Nation and Navajo Oil and Gas to explore for helium near two communities. Now the Navajo Nation Council approved that measure last week or no, it was not last week, it was like back in January, um, despite concerns about the threat of water contamination and the legacy of abandoned uranium mines. Proponents had said helium extraction could produce millions of dollars a year on revenue. So you know that the coal mines on Navajo Nation along with the Navajo Generating Station, the power plant, has all closed or, or shut down. They, they can't give into the Navajo government um, budget anymore and that is something of concern and to our operating budget anyways. And so they're trying to find new revenue sources, but really what the revenue sources that um, some of the leadership uh, feel is something that should be considered is more extraction. And helium was, was something of, um, that the council did approve of, even though the impacted communities um, of Senasi and Tisnaspas, um, they were against it. They were against that extraction, but council still approved it. And thankfully, uh, President Nez at the time vetoed that. Uh, the, les the legislation would have authorized Navajo Nation Oil and Gas Company to enter into an operating lease agreement for hel helium exploration in the Tohachi Wash near Tisnaspas and in Beautiful Mountain in Porcupine Dome near Sanasi. Community members have raised serious concerns regarding effects on the, on the government and their health that have not been answered, and the Navajo Nation Council raised issues over how the future profit sharing from oil and gas company would be addressed. And that was, his, um, that was President Nez's concern that he wrote in his veto memo. So right now, uh, from, what I, from what I've been told, um, right now, the EPA has a 10-year plan to address uranium on the Navajo Nation. EPA will work with the Navajo Nation toward completing investigation and cleanup of 230 mine sites where EPA and the Navajo Nation secured funding and a commitment to perform work. EPA and the Navajo Nation had secured funding to assess and clean up 230 of 523 abandoned uranium mine sites on or near the Navajo Nation and an additional 16 Tronix mines in the Grants Mining District of New Mexico. This funding is largely derived from a combination of enforcement agreements and settlements valued at over $1.7 billion. This amount includes funding from the United States secured through settlements with the Navajo Nation, trust settlements, and through settlements with private companies like Tronix Settlement. 
On top of this, EPA has consistently invested up to $5 million per year toward investigating and cleaning up contaminated structures and supporting the involvement of Navajo agencies in the assessment and cleanup um, process. When it comes to water, multiple studies will be conducted to investigate the potential impacts of AUM on surface water and groundwater. When it comes to drinking water, the IHS, or Indian Health Services, and um, EPA will continue to increase access to safe drinking water in the AUM regions of the Navajo Nation. Uh, Dr. Tommy Rock currently is working, is a researcher at, um, well, he has a research fellowship, actually, in, at Prin Princeton University, and he is, he is um, working on research uh, related to the Sanders water area. And when I asked him what he thinks about helium exploration and other mineral extractions, I remember him saying, uh, I spoke to him a couple days ago from my article again, he just basically said that um, our Navajo leadership aren't aware, they're not, they, they're not knowing of, they're not knowledgeable of mineral extraction and its consequences. And I asked him what he thought about the mine waste being taken um, to the mill site a mile down the road from the Navajo Nation. And he said, well, if it's the place I'm thinking that it's at, then a lining will will, is needed. Um, I was trying to ask him more about what, what he meant by lining, but he had to go. So he just also said, like, nobody is listening to the community. The community, for as long as I've known them, have always said they do not want this waste. They want this waste off, off the Navajo Nation. And Tommy and Terry, um, they both said the same thing. Like, you can compare this waste um, transfer to places like Moab and Grand Junction, where waste was taken completely off the area uh, money wasn't uh, an issue, and, they, and this is what Terry said, this, she called it environmental racism, and so I can't help but, but believe that. So, but thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Arlisa, that was a really powerful talk, and thank you for sharing your personal stories and introducing us to the community members that you've been talking to. And I want to invite our in-person audience um, to ask questions and also our virtual audience. If you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat for Arlisa. But do we have any questions in the room to get started? All right, well, I guess I have kind of a technical question for you. What does the process look like for beginning to clean up the land and the water? Because you were talking about how it's just soaked into the vegetation and it's everywhere. So what does that process look like and, and how long would that process take? Oh goodness, there was like a listing of what they would have to do next. And I know there's gonna be another form of meetings to discuss that with, um, the, with I think NRC or EPA and the Navajo Nation. But I really can't um, say exactly what, what's next. I knew I should have looked into that a little bit no, more. No, that was like a technical question, yeah. so it was unfair. But yeah, I'm just kind of wondering about that because it seems like such a, a big project that is needed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, we're just getting comments in the chat thanking you for your presentation. And you were, t you were talking about Terry, and I think I read your article about her and how she's yeah. educating the kids with, um, with that information about uranium mining. And I was wondering if you were able to talk to any of the kids or get a sense of their reaction to learning about this and how did they deal with something so serious like that when they're, when they're 10 years old? Yeah, exactly. I wanted to talk to them and I, I felt like I had to ask her permission and um, I couldn't talk to any of them. But I did ask her, like, how do these kids uh, respond to your type of, you know, to, this, to these activities? And they, she, she, doesn't say, she didn't say much, they, they didn't really think about it because they're kids, but um, the fact that they know that this is there, um, at least she, she said that at least she knows that they know that this type of thing is something to look out for. Yeah. So the, the mill sites, these were, this is a place where maybe, um, uh, where uh, rock was brought to be crushed and yeah. processed and that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Those sites are near 
the old mines, the abandoned sites? Yeah, yeah, they are. And why is there no uh, record of, of people, of companies that would have been responsible? Or, exactly. Or, I mean, were these small time operations, people coming from one place to another, or were these big companies that came in and did exploration? Some were big and some were really small. Um, the, the bigger ones, I don't know how long it took for them to, to find out who the responsible parties are, but I know some are, very, are under investigation. But some are so small that you know, they, they, they cease to exist now, these companies. And are there investigations about how, you said something about DNA being changed. Mm -hmm. Are there are there studies going on about how there is a cohort? Yeah. Okay. So there is a cohort. I wish I've written about a little bit more that study um, babies, and they've done studies with uh, mothers who who were impacted or you know lived in the impacted areas, and I think it was called the uranium the the Navajo uranium mother cohort, or I forget what it was called, but yeah, there are studies do, done by that, and that's something I should look into. But um, that's one of the studies that is done, and that's one of the things that, that is usually reported on to the council. Gosh, there seems like there's so many parts of this. Yeah, there is, there's a lot. It's just so many different angles and so much um, research that needs to be done. A waste. Um, can you, as Congressman, hold the EPA accountable for difference in action on the Navajo Nation versus other locations? Oh, that's a good question. That's, that's a big question. That's a big question. I, I don't know. I, that's, you know. That's the question that I, I really don't know how to answer. Um, I think just probably calling the Navajo Nation EPA Superfund Group would be a good start. Um, we do have an environmental protection agency on the Navajo Nation that's really good. And they have their own Superfund group that works with the US EPA Superfund. And they are very knowledgeable people. And they know exactly where all these AUMs are. And they know all the community members that they can talk to. And answer to the other question, there is going to be a recording of this program made available after, um, after tonight. And I guess I'll, I have one more question if we don't have any more in-person questions. Oh, Maya, do you have a question? OK. First of all, thank you so much um, for your topic. So what really was a draw to me in your speech, I think it's something that's really pertinent in the discussions that we're having now, is what I performed activism done by the people that are showing up in these communities, people that are, I feel, transactionally coming into these different communities. What can we do as members to support one another, I feel, in a roundabout way to support one another, even if we're not a part of that person's community, even broader than the indigenous community, mm -hmm. to be there but not cross that line. I think the best place to start when it comes to this is talking with um, the Red Water Pond Community Association because they are, they are a really well-known group of people who are who um, I know Terry testifies a lot on the human rights and everything that's been happening in her community. And I wish I, I knew where she testified at, I forget. Um, but yeah, I think if somebody wants to show their solidarity with, with this, there are a lot of different groups, not just Red Rock um, Pond, but there's also little groups like the Ke, the Ke Info Shop, KE Info Shop, and they, they also have a lot of um, um, events that deal with this type of, of um, environmental environmental um, crisis. Not 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 just uranium, but like like Chaco Canyon and what's happening there with um, with oil and gas, with with coal mine. You know, those types of little groups are always something that um, people should look into. Thank you for that question. Do we have any more questions for the in-person audience? Yep. 
I'm looking forward to going home and learning about helium <laughs> extraction. There's oh yeah, so yeah. I I have a couple of articles on that already, so it's it's pretty, it's it's intense of what's going on there. Well, we look forward to reading those articles. We are at 7 o'clock now, so we're going to wrap up the program, everyone. Thank you for joining, um, and thank you to our virtual audience for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you.